have to place empties out when we dismiss the children. Well, if you've been with us this whole year, we have been doing uh, a doctrine series. We've gone through the doctrine of uh, uh, theology proper, and we've gone through Christology and pneumatology and all the things that we've gone through, and we are finally in eschatology. And so for the last weeks, we've been preaching about things that are, go- that are coming. And, uh, and this morning, is, uh, we're going to kind of finish the second half of the book of Revelation and it is a lot to take in, and I understand that it's a lot to take in, and, uh, and you're not going to have a full understanding, but my goal and my prayer has been that as we go through this, that you will recognize, that you'll be able to see some major events that are going to happen in the future, and I think that as we see those things that are going to happen in the future, it's pre-written history is what, uh, what eschatology is, and uh, my prayer is that as we go through this, that you'll recognize some things that even we're seeing a, uh, a push for a one world government, we're for one world economy, we're seeing lots of pushes. Those are all signs of the end. But I want to remind you again that I'm not here to say that Christ is coming back tomorrow. I don't know when he's coming back. But I know that everything that needs to have happened before he, he comes back has already happened. The only thing left, the next event on God's timetable is the rapture of the church. And we'll talk about that this morning. But I want to um, remind you that our outline of this book of Revelation we find in the first chapter. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 19, uh, John tells us how to divide this book. He said, God told John, John, I want you to write down the things that you've seen. And we see in chapter 1, John saw Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, not the Jesus, the Lamb of God who t- takes away the sin of the world and, and, uh, when he was on the earth. He sees Jesus with his eyes like fire and his hair white as wool and he sees the white garment that he has with the golden sash and he sees his feet are like bronze it's signifying that he is pure and he is just and his judgment will be absolutely final. And so when John, when John sees him in Revelation 1, he doesn't even recognize him, the man that he was, the, that he was closest to. Uh, and, but he recognizes that this is Jesus in all his glory. And so we see that in chapter 1. So that's the first division. Chapters 2 and 3, we talked about that the first week, are the, the churches during the, uh, during the church age. And we looked, at, we looked at five of them, but there are seven churches that are, um, that are talked about through that. And that is the age that we're in now. And so those are the things that are. We are in the church age. And then the things that happen after this is the third division. And that is the things that, um, the things that happen after this are going to be from the rapture of the church to for our eternity future. Okay, so um, if you can put that uh, slide up, Jesse. So if you remember, we're, so we're, he wrote the things that you've seen on your far left, the things that are, that is the church age, and then the rapture of the church happens, I told you, it happens between chapter 3 and chapter 4. We read about it in the book of First and Second Thessalonians. We also see, I think it's a pretty good image in chapter 4, that um, John heard the trumpet and he went to heaven, ends up in heaven. So that's kind of where we've been. Well, what we've done, what we did last week is we talked for the first half of, through the first half of the tribulation, from the rapture until the abomination of desolation. And we saw in, uh, we saw in chapter uh, five, or or chapter four, John's in heaven, we're in the throne room of heaven. You see all the, all the churches rejoicing. And every time that we see the church throughout the book of Revelation, we always see them in heaven. Now we will see saints, tribulation saints during that that will be on earth and then we'll see them later under the throne in heaven because they will be martyred during that time. But, that, but the church is not there. And the reason the church isn't, isn't there, that we're not in this tribulation, this is the time of Jacob's trouble as we talked about last week. And that time of Jacob's trouble is part of the, part of the Abrahamic covenant. God will restore the nation of Israel back to Himself. And during this tribulation period, it is for the revival of that nation. So when God takes us out, He's going to leave, uh, he's going to leave them two witnesses. We don't know who they are yet. I told you last week, if God's looking for a volunteer, I'll volunteer because they're going to call fire down from heaven, all kinds of cool stuff. But they don't end very well. They will end. We saw, that, we saw how they ended last week in chapter 11. They killed them. They drugged them around the streets. They celebrated like Christmas. And then after three days, they ascended into heaven and the whole world watched. And that begins the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation that we're going to talk about this morning. And I, I'll just be honest with you, it's no fun to preach this stuff. It's, no, it's going to be the worst time, literally the worst time on earth. And then after it's over, it's going to get worse because those who, uh, those who are in that 
time period that have rejected Christ, accepted the mark of the beast, are going to spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. All right, so we ended last week with the abomination of desolation. You see I have a throne there. That is when Antichrist, who we saw, came riding in on the white horse in chapters, uh, chapter 5, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the, uh, the pale horse. The white horse was the Antichrist bringing false peace. He's going to make false, he's going to confirm a covenant. We talked about that last week. Um, then, he's going to, then he's going to wage war. We're going to see that. Um, that is the Ezekiel, I believe that's the Ezekiel war that, we're, that we'll see in the first half of the tribulation. Then there will be um, uh, the uh, pale or the black horse is famine. Um, so what do you get after famine and war? Well, death. That's the pale horse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I believe that that's kind of covering the whole. It's kind of a big view of the whole tribulation, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to be here. But I want to start, I want to pick up at the abomination of desolation. Now what that is, is when Antichrist will go, the temple, the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt. If you want to research something awesome, go look at all the, thing, all the, all the things that are already ready for them to build the temple. They have everything ready. In fact, in order to operate the temple, they need like 400 priests. Well, they have to have been trained from 12 years old until adulthood, and they already have those 400 priests trained. When they walk into the temple, they will be able to, operate the temple exactly like they, like they planned from the very beginning. So sometime in that first half of the tribulation or before, the temple will be built in Jerusalem. And the only problem right now is the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim temple, is right there at the same place. But if you read about this, they think they can build it on the other side and that that's actually the actual place. So there's some really cool stuff happening there. I don't want to get too deep into this, but I, but, and I want you to understand as we go through this, I know I'm going fast, and I know that there are, you're going to have a lot of questions. Write your questions down. Next week, we're going to have a question and answer. We'll have our tabletop discussion. You can ask whatever question you want. Dr. Croy's going to answer them all for us. But this morning, I want, to, I want us to look starting in chapter 12. So understand where we're at in the tribulation. We're starting at, at the midpoint of the tribulation. In chapter 12, we see this image. And I want you to understand, it's apocalyptic writing. So a lot of the image that you see, it's not necessarily a dragon. And it's not necessarily, um, it, it is, it's apocalyptic writing. So what he's talking about, we're gonna, we'll try to explain. So chapter 12, it says this, A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now let me just stop right there. This is the sun-clad woman. This is a picture of Israel. Well, Pastor Chris, how do you know this is a picture of Israel? Because I read Genesis chapter 37, 9 through 11. Do you remember when Joseph had his dream? And Joseph had his dream and he went to his dad and he dreamt about the 12 stars bowing down to him and, and all of this. This is exactly the description that he gave there. And Joseph's father, Israel, Jacob, said, you stop that. Don't you put that stuff away. Don't talk about that. His brothers got mad at him, sold him into slavery for it. But this is the picture and the image is Israel. That's who he's talking about here. Well, Joseph didn't understand that. His name hadn't even been changed yet. Or Jacob hadn't, didn't understand that. His name hadn't even been changed to Israel yet. But that is Israel. The 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is who the Great Tribulation is for. So uh, it's a reference to Joseph's dream. The sun, moon, and stars represent Israel. Um, the great dragon, and we read about that in verse 3, and it says, the fire, there, uh, Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. Now, it's not a literal dragon with, ten, with seven heads and ten horns or uh, ten crowns. This is, uh, this is Satan. He's always tried to dominate the world and has been Israel's arch enemy. He's red because it's the color of bloodshed. This is the, uh, it's referring to the red horse, I believe, in uh, in chapter 5, the dragon is a winged serpent. Uh, it, the seven heads, it speaks of his intelligence. The ten horns, uh, horns are a symbol of power. Satan is not all powerful, but he is powerful. And the ten may refer to the ten nations that will figure greatly in the last days. There will be a, um, a, combined, a, a combination of ten nations that are going to come together and the, they will put Antichrist into power and he comes into power at the midpoint of the tribulation. Um, and then uh, verse 5, we read about the man-child. Um, the man-child is none other than Jesus Christ. 
And uh, he's in heaven right now, but he will come and bring his people home to be with him. But then we read something really unsettling in, uh, in this chapter is war breaks out in heaven. Now, what in the world? War breaks out in heaven? Why would war, war break out in heaven? I thought heaven was a place we're going where it's all peace and tranquility and then we sit on clouds and play harps all day. Well, that we are gonna, we're going to be in heaven. We're going to worship a lot in heaven. But there is, Satan has access. The Bible tells us that Satan stands there accusing us night and day before God. But Jesus Christ, the judge advocate, stands there de- uh, declaring us not guilty because he died for us. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But there's a war that breaks out in heaven. Now, I want you to understand, Satan was thrown out of heaven, but there are three heavens. There is the high heaven where God himself sits. On his throne. That's where that's the high heaven. There is going to be war that breaks out there, and God's going to throw Satan down. He's already thrown him down one heaven. He's going to throw him down to this earth, and he will be confined to this earth. And Satan will not like that at all. And what's he going to do? He's going to wage war against Israel because he knows that God loves Israel, that God that they're God's chosen people, and he is going to go after them. It is going to be a terrible time. But it takes us back to think about this. But the Bible tells us that Michael and his angels will fight against Satan and throw them out of heaven. And he's not going to be happy. Again, he's going to take with him the keys to the bottomless pit. He's going to let several demons out of there. Abaddon and Apollyon. Uh, I can't remember what their names mean. Destruction, destroyer and something else. But they will come down. or Satan's going to release them out of the pit. And then they are going to wage war. And this is interesting. They will wage war against themselves, basically. In other words, when, when, he, when they're released, they're let, they're let out to torment those who have accepted the mark of the beast. They're, they're attacking their own, basically. All of those who have the mark of the beast will be tormented for six months. It's crazy. You know why they can't torment those, those tribulation saints? Because they will have the seal of Christ on their forehead. You say, well, how do they get that? Well, they do it the same way that Abraham did it, by faith, by grace. By, by grace through faith in Christ alone. In the Old Testament, how did they get saved? They looked forward to Christ coming. In the New Testament, how did we get saved? We look, for, we look back to what Christ did, how he died on the cross, paid his penalty for our sin, and we accept what he did as payment for our sin. And he sealed all of us. He's guaranteed us that we are, um, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit with promise. And then in the tribulation, there will be tribulation saints that will be saved the same way. But I want to get back to this. I don't want to get too deep into this. But, um, but, he's, uh, but Israel will flee into the mountains. God will protect them. Satan will go after them. Uh, and the rest of her offspring, those saved by the 144,000 male virgin Jews. You say, well, how do you know there are 144,000? How do you know there are male virgin Jews? Well, because I read the book. It tells us very clearly um, listen, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of uh, of different religions that talk about uh, talk about these 144,000. Uh, think that they're the they're the 144,000. But I want you to understand that the Bible tells us very clearly who this 144,000 is. This uh, we read about it in chapter 14. It says, "Then I then I looked, and there on the Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him were 144,000 with his name." On, uh, and his father's name written on their forehead. And I heard a sound, of a, uh, sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder. A sound heard was also like a harpist playing with their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones that, uh, that not defiled by women for they have kept their virginity. They are the ones who follow the Lamb whoever uh, wherever he goes they were redeemed from the human race as the first fruits for God the lamb no lie was found in their mouth they were blameless these are the 144,000 they are male virgin Jews who come to Christ again we have to remember what's the tribulation for it's for the time of Jacob's trouble it's for national regeneration of Israel that's part of the new covenant is God's going to restore Israel back to him and that's what's going to happen here they, the two witnesses are going to lead these 144,000 to Christ. The 144,000 are going to lead an untold multitude to Christ. So I want you to know that the hope, there's still hope for those that don't get saved today. But I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't want to be here. So uh, we come to chapter 13. Um, chapter 13, we read about the dragon, that is Satan. 
the Antichrist. That's the beast from the sea with ten horns. When it says the beast from the sea, that's talking about the sea of humanity. That this beast is going to be a human being that comes out of the sea of humanity. So you have Satan who is the Godhead figure in this. Satan has an unholy trinity. He's never had an original thought in his head. And all he's going to do is he's going to try to deceive everybody and set them up to look just like God. So the beast, or the, so Satan is the dragon. Then he sets up the beast, who's the, or um, sets up the Antichrist, who will desecrate the temple and claim and force everyone to worship him. And you'll have the false prophet who will be the religious leader who will point everyone to worship the false prophet. That's bad stuff going on there. And that's when the Antichrist is going to sit in the throne room of the temple. That's when they will enforce and put into practice the mark of the beast where you will, have, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. Uh, it's just bad, bad stuff that's going on there. Um, so, uh, again, it represents the sea of humanity. Um, the ten horns represents power. Again, possibly from these ten nations, this one, this one person will be, rise to power. Um, but uh, he will implement the mark of the beast. He pushes people, the false prophet will push people to worship Antichrist. He energizes the image of Antichrist and will be able to, he'll be able to talk to him and kill. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's, they'll have a chip in there and if, they, if you're not worshiping, they hit a button and, you know, a new kitchen. I, I don't know what they're doing. I, I don't understand a lot of this writing. Uh, but what we need to understand is that Satan will claim to be Christ and lots of people will follow him and, uh, and they will receive the mark of the beast. Verse 16 through 18. I want to read that real quick for you. Um, verse 16 through 18 of chapter, uh, chapter 13. It says this. And he requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name or the number of his name. Uh, here's the thing. You will know. Like, I have people ask me all the time, what is this, you know, if I get the COVID vaccine, is that the mark of the beast? Listen, I don't believe that you're going to know. You will know exactly what you're taking. You'll know it's the mark of the beast. I think that's going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation. But I, I, do th I do suspect that a lot of things that are happening now that are going to be forced on people, it just moves us like sheep to be willing to take things. And, uh, and so, I'm, I, you know, it's all of this stuff I look at and I, I try to look at it from a prophetic viewpoint that uh, what's going to happen. Um, but the mark of the beast will, uh, it's, uh, it will represent, it will be 666, that's just the number of man. Uh, man was created on the sixth day. Seven is God's perfect number. Um, but, uh, but you know, it's interesting. I was talking to, I think I was talking to Rob recently and he said that he went to an Amazon store, like an actual, I didn't know there were Amazon stores that you can actually go in the Amazon store, but he said he went, walked in there and he's an Amazon prime member as probably everybody else in here is, but he walked into the store, he picked up like 15 items, turned around and walked out of the store, never stopped at a cashier or anything. And he got a receipt for all of the, all of the items that he picked up. That's, what the, that's how they'll sell the Mark of the Beast. It'll be real easy. You can just go in and pick up whatever you want, order whatever you want. It'll, just go, it'll be a cashless society. I think, we're seeing the, I think we're seeing lots of that coming to fruition right now. But I'll, I'm going to skip over. That. So we, could spend, we could spend weeks in each one of these chapters, and we don't have time. So chapter 14, again, is the 144,000. Um, they will be murdered for preparation of the bold judgment. Chapter 14 simply seems to give us a broad overview of the second half of the tribulation from the abomination of desolation to Armageddon. 144,000 uh, will be killed. Um, we saw in chapter 13 that the Antichrist will make war against the saints. These are them, uh, and, and they, will, uh, they will lead an untold multitude to Christ, but they will be martyred in the second half of the tribulation. If you remember when we were in, I think it was chapter 5, and we saw... Under the altar, there were the, the saints that were under the altar that was crying out, Avenge us, Lord! Avenge us, Lord! Who are they? They are these people that were killed during the tribulation. These tribulation saints who are calling out for the Lord to avenge us. And he says, wait, I will avenge you. Just wait a little while. And so uh, that's what's happening here in chapter 14. Um, uh, in chapter 15, I'm going to jump there. Um, chapter 15 is preparation in heaven for the last judgments. Now, it's interesting as you study this book is you go through different parts of the book and there are sort of like God's giving John a respite because he takes him on earth and John's seeing all the horror that's happening on earth and he's, you know, it's just overwhelming to him 
And then God takes him back into heaven for a respite. And here in chapter 15, something really interesting happens. The throne room of God is full of smoke, so he can't see what's going on in there. And he's out, he's out there, and he, uh, it shifts to heaven, and more worship's going on, but something else is happening. It seems to be a private thing because the temple is full of smoke from the glory of God, and you see this tremendous scene because, uh, because smoke is coming out of the temple, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the bold judgment were completed. So uh, may, I, I don't know exactly what that means. There's a lot of things. I, we were talking in our, uh, our small group has been going through this study in Revelation, and I said, you know, there's several times, chapter 10 is one that's just really strange. I don't know what's happening there. But I think these chapters will mean something to those tribulation saints who are going through this. And I don't know what that is, but I think it will be crystal clear to them. But it's not clear for us right now. And I'm not going to make any pretend, pretense like I know everything about this book. I've been studying it for a long time, but I, I'm still learning. But that's what's happening in chapter 15. We come to chapter 16, and the bold judgments begin. Now, I just want to tell you about these bold judgments. They are awful. When these bold judgments happen, this will be, I believe, at the very end of the tribulation because I don't think anyone will be able to last very long when these bold judgments happen. And they're going to happen like a machine gun. I mean, it's going to be judgment after judgment after judgment on all of this uh, kind of right away. So so we come here. um, I think I just skipped the page. Um, so chapter 16 is the bowl judgment. So the first bowl is poured out and ugly, painful sores break out on everyone who has the mark of the beast. Isn't that interesting? All the people that have the mark of the beast, they're going to get these horrible sores all over their body. Um, uh, the second bowl is poured out and, and the, and the sea is turned to blood and everything in the sea died. If you remember, we went through some of the other judgments and the sea was judged at that, but only a fourth of the sea was dead at that time. But now in this final, in these bold judgments, all of the sea is going to die. And I mean everything in it. Can you imagine the stench in the world? That the sea is turned to blood and the stink from all of it is going to be everywhere. Um, the... Uh, the third angel poured out his bowl and all of the fresh water. So what are you going to drink? If all of the fresh water becomes blood and all of the ocean water becomes blood, you're not going to be able to drink much. And so it's going to be a horrible time. The next one makes it even worse. The fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun and the sun will scorch people with fire. And they were, uh, they were seared. And notice what they do in verse 9. They refused to repent. They're going to know it. And they're going to know it's God, and they're going to refuse to repent. This boggles my mind, but I, but I think back on, as I told you before, I'm a dispensationalist. I believe that God deals with people during a particular period of time where left to himself, man will never choose God. But God chose to deal with us through grace right now. He offered his son to come down and die on the cross and accept what he did as payment for our sin. And if we do that, he offers us grace and salvation. Salvation not only from this tribulation, but salvation from hell. That we will be saved to the uttermost, the Bible says. But how many people refuse to accept Christ while they're down here on earth now? And do you think when they make it into the tribulation period that they're going to be, they're going to be quick to turn to Christ? It's amazing to me. I, there's another verse that talks about that, how God's going to send strong delusions so that people will believe a lie. And to be honest with you, this is what I believe. I believe that, God, that those who've heard the gospel, who've heard a clear presentation of the gospel and rejected it, I think those are the people that God's going to send strong delusions to. God's given you all this grace to accept what His Son did. And how many people have heard the gospel and rejected it? And that, that's the unpardonable sin, to reject the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. I've shared with you before about going to the hospital and dealing with a, dealing with a man and, and, I, and he would, I, we offered him the gospel and he'd say, no! And it was like God telling us, that's it. That was the final time and Travis and I got on, a, got on an elevator and got to the bottom, we walked out, we gave the guy the gospel, he said, I don't want that garbage and he shouted no. And we walked out of there, we got down to the first floor, we walked out of the elevator, they came and got us, they said, did you just come see Mr. Uh, Bucky? And I said, yeah. And they said, he died. He committed the unpardonable sin. He rejected the Holy Spirit over and over and over again until he died. And I believe that maybe some people are going to reject God, reject what Christ has done for them. They're going to make it into tribulation thinking, well, I can live my life now and then in tribulation, I'll just turn to Christ. No, you won't. We see it here. People just refuse to accept God, refuse to accept Christ. 
The fifth angel pours out his bowl and darkness covers the entire earth. Now think about this. There's, I don't mean just a little bit of darkness. I don't mean just turn out the lights and you have the stars. There's this darkness. We read about this in, uh, we read about this in Matthew 24. But the fifth angel of this darkness, they will gnaw their tongues in agony, but they will curse God. The sixth angel poured out his bowl and the Euphrates River dried up to prepare for the final battle. All of the armies on the earth will gather at Armageddon. I've been there. I've stood on the plain. Napoleon said it was the finest battlefield he's ever seen on the face of the earth. And three unclean spirits like frogs are going to come out of the uh, Antichrist and the, um, and the false prophet. Uh, these demons were, will, will come and gather there to fight against God's army. They come out of the slime of hell and it is and uh, hell itself and out of their mouth are the dragon, uh, the dragon and the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet. And there, by the way, you have the unholy trinity. They are spirits of demons working miracles. They gather the world to the battle of Armageddon and they don't know it. it's the great day of the Lord. And all the world will come to Armageddon and fight. Daniel 11, I think, describes it as the kings of the north come down and sweep through the south. The kings of the east come up and, and the west gets involved and the kings of the east come. They're all fighting and this massacre is going to be, or is going on. In the midst of all of this, uh, out of heaven comes Jesus Christ. All these armies are con- coming down to this valley of Armageddon and Jesus Christ is going to come out of the sky and he will stick his sickle in the ground signifying he's going to destroy it this will will be the end now we come to chapter 17 and 18 and chapter 17 and 18 are parenthetical passages in other words they're taking a deeper look at what's happening in certain spaces so chapter 17 is going to deal with the religious life during the tribulation you say how can there be religious life during the tribulation i mean aren't all the christians gone yeah the christians are gone but the church will still be here Listen to me, the church has nothing to do with Christianity. The church, the church, the real church, we are the church who accepted Christ. But it's not this building, it's not the liturgy that we have. It is those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. The real church will be taken out of here, but organized religion will, will flourish during that time. And there will be an organized religion that people will worship the beast. And the, and the false prophet's going to encourage everyone to worship the beast. And so what's happened in, in religious life during the tribulation? This is going on in the second half of the tribulation, but the time, uh, but this time looking at the religion, there will be religion, a false church. You know what it's called? Do you, you know what we're called? I told you this, I tell you this all the time because I think it's so beautiful. The church from, from the resurrection of Christ until the second, or to the rapture, what are we called? We're the bride. Or the bride of Christ. Do you know what this false church is called? The harlot. Or the whore. Why? Because it's the church about... Listen, do you know where false religion started on the earth? If you go back to Genesis and they went and they tried to build the tower of what? Babel. Why? They were trying to point their finger at God and say, you don't own me. We can build our own. We can be the best. We don't need you. Antichrist is a political leader and the false prophet is the spiritual leader who will point people to worship Antichrist. Antichrist will be consumed with his power and demand that everyone worships him. And if you don't worship him, then you will be killed. He will eventually do away with all religion except his own worship. This will most likely happen after the image is set up for people to worship. I told you this last week, but just to reiterate it. The Muslims are looking for the 12th Iman. They are looking for this they're looking for the Antichrist. They just don't know it. They're looking for the 12th Iman. The Jews are looking for Christ to come. They didn't accept them the first time. They're looking for a, a Messiah to come. And all the world is going to fall in line with this. I mean, think about the, tre- the, the horror that's going on the earth. I mean, the rapture comes. The church is gone. Millions of people are gone. And then all of a sudden, all of this stuff is, begins to happen. And they're looking for somebody to worship. And they're going to point them to Antichrist. And they're all going to blindly follow. What's interesting, at the end of chapter 17, it says they made war with the Lamb. <laughs> but the Lamb will conquer But you know what's interesting? All of the people that were following this false religion at the end of the tribulation period, they are going to turn against this false prophet, this harlot. They're going to turn against the 
the false prophet. And I believe they're going to kill the man. And I think that's why the demon comes out that we read before. They're turning against them because they're going to realize. But you know what? They still don't turn to Christ because they've already accepted the mark of the beast. They're frozen in unrighteousness. Chapter 18, we read about the economic life during the tribulation. You see, in our world right now, we, we worship money and we worship power more than anything. That's why we have corruption everywhere. Because people just want more money, more money, more money. And people are so uh, programmed that we have to have this and we have to have this. And if you don't have this, your value's not much. Listen, you know what I need? I need Jesus Christ and Him alone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But everything starts to collapse. In verse 2 we read, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen. Babylon is the name of the final world economic system. I shared with you last week how we, we will see a revived Roman Empire. You remember Rome conquered the world and they had the world and it just ended. We saw the Medo-Persians, the, the Greece, Grecians came in and took over the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians were defeated by the, uh, the Grecian, or I'm sorry, the, the Babylonians were taken over by the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians were taken over by, uh, by Greece and then Greece was overcome by Rome. No one conquered Rome. Rome just ended. It ended during the church age. But there will be a revived Roman Empire, a revived one world economy, one world ruler, and that's what we're talking about, this Babylonian system. This is underpinning throughout history, but this Babylonian empire will be revived, this Roman Empire will be revived, and that's what's happening here. And so this Roman Empire is coming to an end. Uh, chapter 18, again, um, verse 5 says that the sins of the world reach to heaven and God has remembered her iniquity. It's interesting that he's talking about the, the sins of the world reach to heaven. You remember the Babylon, they, the uh, Tower of Babel, they were trying to build it to heaven. But it's reached heaven, the sins reached heaven and God's going to judge it. When they begin to see the whole world system collapse, everybody's economy collapses. You can read it in verses 11 through 23, but there's no more banks and there's no more money, and there's no more shopping, and no more transportation, and no more everything. I mean, you can go down the line, no more spices. There's nothing left. You can't buy, what are you going to buy or sell? There's nothing. The world is in ruin. And everyone will be brought down to nothing. At that point, everyone will be trying to survive. And, and you, won't have, you won't have people in these high offices all protected because God's destroyed everything about it. They will all come tumbling down because God is showing them that He alone is King of kings and Lord of lords. Other thing that I found fascinating in this is verses 22 and 23. There's no more music or entertainment and there's no more weddings. I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Israel. It was one of the hardest places I've ever been through. You go through it, and, and it starts at the bottom, and you just kind of wind up the wind up this building. And everywhere you go, it's just starting from the beginning where they started with the propaganda to dehumanize the Jews, and it went all the way up to where they were in these concentration camps where they were murdered and things. But one of the things they had in these in the, that they had were the music uh, the music things that they made while they were in these because they needed music. It was so important to them. Even in the Holocaust and all the horrible things that they did to them, they had music. There will be no more music and there will be no more weddings. I mean, it's bad stuff. But thank God we get to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1, you read, Hallelujah. Verse 2, or verse... Three, you read hallelujah. Verse four, you read hallelujah. Verse six, you read hallelujah. Well, what are they so excited about? They're excited because we are at the marriage supper. We're at the marriage. We were at the marriage supper, but we were we are actually going to be wed to Christ at that point. They're excited because God is omnipotent, that He's all powerful, that Jesus reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready and now the redeemed are joined to the Lord. Now let me just stop here because there are, there's a bunch of wrong 
understanding about this. A lot of people think that this is where the church comes after, after all the stuff happened on the earth. But we, we never saw the church on earth. We see them in heaven. When we get here, people say, well, well now we're getting married. Well, listen, in the Jew, you have to understand the Jewish weddings. What they did was they would celebrate for seven days. And those seven days they would celebrate during this time. And on the seventh day, the, the groom would come in and he would marry the bride and they would go consummate the marriage. And it, it was, that was how it worked. When the rapture comes, the bride is going up and we're getting prepared. And we're going to come out at that end wearing our white, pure white, clothed in white, just like Christ. We're going to mount up on our white horses just like Jesus and we're going to follow Him back to this earth as He's going to reclaim the earth and win the battle of Armageddon. We're going to put on our best, whitest robe or whatever we'll wear and follow Him back. I love this. Uh, Verse 11 says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and him that sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And his eyes are like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew. The armies that were in heaven followed him on a white horse clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. This is Jesus Christ coming back to set up his kingdom on the earth. And he's coming in on a white, on white horse and we're coming right behind him on white horses with garments of white with them. I love the end of 16. It says, His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he comes, devastation, Armageddon, and the result of Armageddon in verse 17 and follows, carnage, death, He calls the birds to eat the flesh. Verse 20, the beast, the false prophet, are both cast alive into the lake of fire, uh, burning with brimstone. And the people and the armies who remained are slaughtered with a sword. I'm glad that part's over. It's over for me. And if you know Christ, it's over for you because we will spend, we will go, we will be in heaven during the tribulation period. But if you don't know Christ, I would encourage you right now. I'm going to give the invitation in just a minute, but the invitation has come. He he stands here waiting for you to come. Chapter 20, the Lord sets up his kingdom. Verse 4, he says, I saw thrones. What are they for? Look at the end of the verse. They are for the saints who lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The thrones are for us. We, church, are going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Well, who are we going to rule and reign for a thousand years? We're all Christian. We're the church, right? Well, wait a second. How about those tribulation saints? And I want to make sure we get this because there will be people that will live through the tribulation. All the people aren't at Armageddon. These armies are at Armageddon. There will be people who have lived. Remember, we saw the two witnesses led the 144,000 who led an untold multitude to Christ. Many of them are martyred during the tribulation, but some of them will make it through. And when they make it through, they won't have a glorified body. We will be frozen in righteousness. I will have received my glorified body. I will not be able to sin again. But those people will be just like us. They will come into the millennial kingdom and it will be set up like uh, Eden, like uh, Edenic times. So they will be able to live for a long time in that period. And they will have children. Their children will have children and grandchildren. You have a thousand years there where the earth is going to be repopulated and we will rule and reign with Christ. But at the end of that thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed and he's going to come out and there will be a group that gathers to try to make war against Christ again. Why? I don't know. But they will be judged immediately. Look at verse 7 there in chapter 20. Satan's loosed for a little while. It says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. They came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded an encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. It's not going to be a very long siege. They're going to come and try to siege God's people and God's going to destroy them utterly right away and that will be the end of sin why is God making a new heaven and a new earth at the end of the millennium because they've both been stained with sin and this will be an end to sin 
And God will make a new heaven and he'll make a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And what a day that's going to be. Chapter 21 tells us about the new heaven and the new earth. I wish I could, I wish I could describe it. I wish I could take the time to describe how unbelievable it's going to be. But we come to chapter 22 and we see one final message. Can I give you the message? Look at verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. You know, Jesus left us, the bride, for one purpose on this earth. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is good news. The good news that we have. The good, I didn't read about good news here. The good news that we have is I don't have to be here. The good news that I have is that Jesus Christ redeemed me. That he sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be together with him forever in glory. And the invitation is this. The invitation is for the, for, that Jesus invites us to come and the bride invites us to come. And whosoever will may come. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what, what baggage you have in your closet. Jesus Christ died to save you from your sin. And my prayer is that no one that has ever heard this message will go to hell. My prayer is that all my family will be in heaven with me. My prayer is all the people that I meet, that, they, that, that I share the gospel with. I can't wait till we're at that marriage supper of the Lamb and I see people that I've led to Christ. I can't wait to see the people that they led to Christ. I can't wait to see the genealogy of Christians through our family. And I, my prayer today is, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, the invitation is from Him and from me to you. The invitation has come to Him. You say, well, I don't know what I got to do. Listen, you don't have to do anything. He did it all. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sin. He resurrected from the grave and ascended into heaven. He guarantees my, he declared me not guilty. He declared me righteous. All I did is say, yes, Lord, I accept what you've done. And my prayer is if you're here this morning and you haven't accepted what Jesus Christ has done for payment of your sin, my invitation is the same as Christ. Why don't you come and trust Jesus? Because that's what it's all about. If you got nothing else from this, this is what I want you to get. This is the whole invitation to come. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. With no one looking around, maybe you're here today and maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. You say, yes, I, I'm a Christian, but man, God's working me over on this. I, you know, I never really studied this. Maybe God's dealing with you because you haven't been sharing the gospel. The invitation is from those of us, the church, the bride of Christ. The invitation is from the bride and from the groom, Jesus, to come be part of this. To come be part of the bride. And maybe God's dealing with you because you know people that, that need salvation and you haven't shared your faith with them. My encouragement to you is go share your share what Christ has done for them it's good news maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved and you say pastor Chris if I die if the rapture came right now I'd still be here I'd be living in that tribulation period and I don't want to be and I want to make sure that I have accepted the free gift that Jesus Christ offered me and I want to become part of the bride you say, Pastor Chris, God's dealing with me right now. Can you pray for me? Because I know that I, I'm not saved and I want to be saved from that. I want to be saved from that hour of tribulation. I want to be saved from hell. If that's your prayer this morning, will you slip up your hand so I can pray for you quickly right where you're at? No one looking around. Church, my prayer is that this, that the whole reason for this is to let us know what things are about to take place. That's what eschatology is. And we know the truth, and now we can share the truth with others. My prayer is that this will cause you to dig into your Bible and make sure you understand what Christ has done. In just a moment, we're going to have an, invita an invitation. Maybe you just need to come and pray for somebody that you know. Maybe you just need to pray for your own peace that, listen, with all the chaos in the world, Jesus is still on the throne. That's what we're going to be celebrating forever. 
I don't know what your need is this morning, but let's stand for prayer and we'll have a hymn of invitation. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and I thank you, God, that you've given us, you've written pre-written history. God, there's so much of the Bible that was pre-written history as it was written, Lord, and it came true over and over and over again. This is just a little bit left. And Lord, I believe that you are coming again. God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that today they'll get that right and that they will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they can go spend eternity with you. Got others here that are saved, Lord, that maybe have been, uh, Lord, just not been uh, doing the job that we've been called to do. I pray, God, that you'll deal with them this morning. God, I pray that you'll be glorified through all of this teaching that we've done through this doctrine. I pray that our church has a more solid understanding of how great you are. But God, I pray that you'll have your will and your way on this invitation. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.